Now, I also want to talk about the deep genealogy of wage labor. This is part two. In this essay, then, I want to pursue the relation of debt and commoditization of labor by looking at the history of the wage relation itself. Considering the dominance of the wage system today, um, it's actually remarkably under-researched. I mean, there's a lot of studies of slavery. I and mean, we just compare how many studies of slavery there are to how many studies of wage labor in antiquity or the Middle Ages, you realize, OK, it's true slavery was actually a more important institution. But it's just like you know, 50 to 1. You know, there's enormous amounts of one and, and surprisingly little on the, on, on the other. Um, I can't think of a single book-length study, tell me, somebody tell me if I'm wrong, about uh, forms of wage contract in the ancient or medieval worlds. And insofar as information about wage contracts is to be found, it's largely inside the literature that's about slavery. And that's, of course, significant in itself, since for most of history, the two institutions were, in fact, closely related. Um, this is well documented in ancient Greece, although I think often people draw the wrong conclusions. Um, essentially, uh, Jonathan Friedman came to the famous conclusion that ancient Greek slavery was really a form of capitalism, whereas I would rather make the argument that capitalism is really a transformation of slavery. Uh, but it is certainly certain that slaves and wage laborers were essentially overlapping categories. Uh, in, in most of Gr ancient Greek history, a freeborn Athenian, or Corinthian for that matter, of the 4th or 5th centuries BC, didn't consider do, you know, being paid to work for a government as in any way shameful, right? Uh, that's because if it's one's own government, one is essentially working for oneself, if one's you know, doing jury duty or building a monument. Uh, you know, Athens wasn't considered an abstraction, Athens. It was the Athenians, and if I am an Athenian, I'm working for the Athenians, I'm working for myself. Um, even hiring oneself out as a mercenary to a foreign potentate was sort of an honorable thing to do. Um, however, hiring oneself out to a private citizen in the same community was totally different. And people really avoided that because you know, it essentially marks you as, as, as a slave. Um, as a result, almost all early wage labor contracts that we are aware of appear to have, in fact, been contracts for slave rental. Um, these arrangements could, as Friedman pointed out, be quite sophisticated, involving the allocation of money wages split between slave and owner to workers maintained in workshops producing for the market. In many ways, they did approximate what we're used to thinking of as capitalist arrangements, but they were an extension of the institution of slavery itself. Now, some of the world systems theorists have, have, have generalized from this. Um, Chase Dunn and Hall, in their book Rise and Demise, argue that uh, capitalism, and like most world systems analysts, are defining capitalism in Brodellian terms um, as basically use, the use of money to make more money. Um, so capitalism, they say, tends to develop within what they call autonomous capitalist city states on the semi peripheries of world systems. The examples they give are Dillman, Byblos, Tyre, Sidon, Carthage, Malacca, Venice, Florence, Genoa, Antwerp, and the cities of the Hanseatic League. Um, even that point is actually an extension of something that a point Brodel had made that if capitalism can only emerge if merchants and financiers are able to ally themselves with governments, um, then small mercantile states is where that's most likely to happen. What's interesting for my own purposes is that these are also the kind of places where it's historic, one is historically most likely to encounter the densest concentrations of chattel slaves, even in periods where chattel slavery had largely been eliminated elsewhere, um, such as the Middle Ages, um, and, and also particularly as a factor of production. Um, so it's those areas where you find sort of nascent capitalists sort of allying with or taking over governments. It is a place where you see the most chattel slaves, but it's also where you see something that resembles wage labor emerging from within the institution of slavery in much the way as you saw happen in ancient Greece. And I think historians have largely missed this because you know, if you look at the exceptions to this, they're mostly in, in, in Northern Europe. European mercantile city-states were somewhat anomalous in this regard. Uh, Southern Europe actually still fits the pattern fairly well. Italian city-states like Venice, Genoa, Florence, Pisa were not only centers of commerce and finance, as we know. They were precisely the part of medieval Europe where slavery 
classic chattel slavery, held on the longest. Um, it's true it was contested. In the 12th century, for example, uh, the slaves that had been employed making cloth by monasteries um, in, I believe it was in Venice, were largely replaced by guild labor. Um, actually, this was across Italy. Um, after that, Italian slaves were rarely employed for producing for the market. But um, that's largely because that was around the time that the use of servile labor for producing for the market shifted away from Italy itself to what were essentially colonial possessions, um, particularly sugar plantations in Crete and Cyprus um, in what many believe provided the model that was later exported first to the Canary Islands and then to the Caribbean. Um, I think all of this happened because in Europe, much unlike the rest of the mercantile, mercantile city-states elsewhere in the world at that time, almost all of which um, were part of the larger Islamic ecubine, if you want to call it that, uh, where Islam and, uh, and Islamic law was a sort of medium of trade or um, arbiter of trade. Uh, and, and enforced a strict division between war and commerce. In Europe, war and commerce was kind of mixed together in a way that um, really didn't happen elsewhere. I talk about this a bit in the debt book, um, which is why the sort of exploitation of servile labor for market purposes by either funded by or directly by mercantile city-states tended to happen as part of like um, military and colonial ventures, um, whereas such things um, in other places happen within the city-states themselves. Um, if you go back to the trading world of the Indian Ocean during the same period, you know, one finds remar with remarkable consistency labor arrangements similar to those of the ancient world, where it's actually almost entirely slaves who are doing wage labor. Um, insofar as we observe wage labor contracts, they are actually slave rental. Um, either because the owners would rent their slaves out directly, or because slaves um, who had achieved a certain amount of autonomy would be allowed to find work on their own and then be expected to turn over a share of the proceeds to their owners.